start. Okay, so welcome to today's seminar. It's a great pleasure to have Alessandro Giuliani with us from the University of Roma Tre and Academia del Lincei. Alessandro is a well-known expert in the mathematical, statistical mechanics with many contributions in various areas. And uh, today he will talk about spontaneous magnetization in the classical 3D Heisenberg model. Thank you and thanks for the introduction and for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here in presence for a real seminar after so, so much time. And uh, um, so today I would like to uh, present uh, some recent results on a very classical topic and um, actually very much connected with the, um, uh, with the topics um, touched in the mini course I gave yesterday and today. And uh, um, the results are, are, are based on joint work uh, um, with uh, Sebastian Otto, just uh, joint work in, and that is uh, almost finished. So um, the setting is the following. So um, I consider classical M vector models uh, on the um, uh, discrete torus in dimension D and side L. This is the Hamiltonian. So you have the sum over nearest neighbor sites of minus uh, uh, scalar product of uh, uh, SX, SY. And then there is possibly a, a term with the magnetic field that I um, think of being uh, uh, oriented in direction N. Um, here, SX is an N uh, component spin um, uh, of uh, Euclidean norm one. And uh, so this model for N equal one is just uh, the, the, the usual easing model. For n equal two is the um, is the x y uh, or sometimes called rotator model. For n equal three is the classical Heisenberg model, and for general n is called just the m vector model. Okay, the um, uh, the problem is to compute the uh, correlation function of some relevant observable, say uh, of the nth component of the spin at zero or the two point spin-spin uh, uh, correlation function uh, at sites X and Y with respect to the, to the measure E to the minus beta H. Um, uh, here, the, the, the reference uh, a priori measure is uh, um, a uniform measure on the, uh, on the, on the N minus one sphere uh, at each site. Um, okay, and we're interested in characterizing the properties uh, of uh, um, of this state uh, obtained by sending first uh, uh, the, the 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 size of the box to infinity, then h to zero plus, and uh, this limit uh, um, uh, exists and is ergodic uh, uh, up to extraction of subsequences, uh, possibly. I mean, in some cases, uh, for instance, for the easing model, uh, more is known, but uh, in, for general n, uh, you are forced to pass to subsequences in general. Um, so uh, ergodicity of the measure means uh, in particular that uh, uh, the two point function uh, of the uh, average uh, against the, the, the limiting uh, uh, infinite volume uh, Gibbs state uh, um, uh, uh, factors in the sense that the limit uh, of the spin, sp spin correlation as the distance goes to infinity is equal to the, um, uh, to the uh, product of the averages, which is uh, uh, in turn uh, independent of the site. And this is uh, nothing but the uh, so-called spontaneous magnetization squared. Um, so let me briefly review what is known or expected for the, the M beta and uh, this uh, two-point function for various choices of the dimension, the temperature, and the number of components of the spin. So let me start with some very easy facts. So if we, if we are in one dimension, any number of components, any temperature, then it's well known that there is no phase transition for the model, in particular, no spontaneous magnetization, exponential decay of correlations, uh, that is uh, um, the, 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 the absolute value of uh, SX, uh, SY averaged is smaller than this exponential. Here, the constants uh, uh, will depend on beta. What about higher dimensions? Okay, if we are in a higher dimension and, and temperature sufficiently large, inverse temperature sufficiently small, then for any number of components, same as above, uh, zero, um, uh, zero spontaneous magnetization, exponential decay of correlation, unique uh, infinite volume give state. So nothing uh, uh, particularly interesting happens in these settings. So the, the first interesting thing uh, takes place uh, for the easing model, n equal one, in dimension two or more. 
uh, at a sufficiently low temperature. In this case, uh, uh, it's known that there is uh, spontaneous magnetization. Actually, much more is, is known. So there is uh, a full uh, um, convergent expansion in the small parameter e to the minus beta. Uh, in dimension d, the, 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 the first two terms are explicitly these ones, if I computed them correctly. And, uh, and then uh, one, one can, in principle, uh, uh, improve the precision uh, uh, in an arbitrary way. And the remainder is smaller than uh, uh, constant to the n e to the minus beta n, let's say. Um, you also have exponential decay of truncated correlation with, again, a very an, uh, an, an, an explicit, very explicit form for these uh, constants here, if you like. Okay, so um, uh, low temperature structure of the um, easing for the easing model is very well known. What about uh, spin uh, systems with two or more components? Okay, so things uh, for um, uh, spins uh, with uh, um, two, uh, two or more components and uh, a rotationally symmetric interaction as the one we considered are qualitatively different. In two dimensions, uh, um, it's uh, well known that uh, the, the so-called Mermin-Wagner theorem predicts that uh, uh, rigorously that uh, the spontaneous magnetization is zero and uh, the um, spin-spin the correlation decay at least uh, um, algebraically fast uh, uh, to zero. Remember, for beta small, uh, the, the decay is, uh, uh, is exponential. Uh, for beta large, uh, the um, uh, simple estimates that I reviewed uh, yesterday and today in the mini course uh, um, uh, provide this upper bound. This upper bound is not necessarily uh, um, um, uh, optimal. And actually, one uh, believes it is not for n equal three or more. In n equal two, there is uh, uh, an algebraic lower bound. Sorry, here there is a typo. This should be larger equal than uh, uh, x minus y to, to another exponent. So this is the, the, the other side of the bound. The upper bound is this one. The lower bound, sorry for the mistake, is uh, uh, an algebraic lower bound uh, with uh, a, a, a wrong exponent. So the, the bounds by Frelick and Spencer predict uh, an exponent that scales uh, um, goes to zero with beta to infinity with the power law that is different from one over beta. Okay, nobody believes that A should be different from uh, one, but uh, as far as I know, this is unproven. Okay, so already here, there is a, there is a first uh, uh, open problem that I recommend. So this should be doable, I think. Uh, prove that the uh, decay exponent, the lower bound, uh, as uh, possibly with a different constant, but uh, with the right power of beta, which should be minus one. Um, okay, another open problem is, uh, is the, um, uh, the, the, the infinite volume Gibbs state uh, uh, unique? So it's known that there is a unique translational invariant Gibbs state, uh, but surprisingly, there is no proof that uh, there are no non-translational invariant uh, Gibbs state. And this is... Uh, another interesting uh, uh, open problem. A big open problem uh, proved that, uh, uh, as predicted by Polyakov, uh, um, the, sorry, here I'm uh, reversing all, <laughs> this should be an upper bound, a uh, smaller equal, I'm sorry. Um, uh, for uh, the conjecture is that if the number of components is three or larger, then the, the, the two point spin-spin uh, correlation should decay with an upper bound that is exponential for all betas, uh, uh, all beta positive. This is a really big open problem. Um, it uh, uh, should be simpler to prove for n sufficiently large, but there are uh, uh, no results uh, unless uh, you, you let n scale with beta in a special way. There are old results by Kupiainen in particular, uh, which uh, proved uh, uh, something of this sort with n uh, going to infinity together with beta. Uh, another interesting uh, um, recent uh, non result is exponential decay for the analogous correlation in the so called uh, uh, loop ON model for N sufficiently large. This is a result by Dominil Copen, Peled, and Spink, and Samoti. Um, okay, this is, this is a very interesting thing that should be sooner or later be, uh, be understood. Okay, what about the three or more dimensions? Uh, so, in three or more dimensions, there is a phase transition in the sense, in particular, that there is uh, uh, spontaneous magnetization at low temperature. This was proven by Frelick, Simon, and Spencer, and I reviewed the proof uh, uh, just this morning. What about uh, um, 
a, a low temperature expansion for m of beta and uh, um, uh, computation of the decay of of, of uh, decay exponent of truncated correlations. So in principle, everything is known. Uh, actually, everything in principle follows. So both the large beta expansion for m of beta and uh, um, uh, asymptotic evaluation of correlation function uh, follow from a series of eight works by Balaban uh, between 95 and 99. But these papers are, are very hard to read and it would be very important, I think, to, to, to extract ideas from this work that uh, certainly contains a lot of uh, very important uh, technical ideas and make them more readable because as far as I know, essentially nobody but the author uh, or, or maybe there are very few exceptions uh, understand uh, this paper. So um, um, th there is actually a much, much simpler approach uh, for, for uh, um, uh, deriving uh, uh, rigorously a low temperature expansion for the spontaneous magnetization due to a method uh, um, introduced by Brickmont from 10 lab of its Lieb and Spencer in 1981. For n equal to, they proved that, that uh, for any truncation n, m of beta is given by the by this series with the coefficient that are explicit are, are, are given by formal spin wave theory, uh, plus a remainder that is uh, lowest order, uh, lower order. Um, so the, this approach uh, works for actually for any. Um, um, uh, well, the, the way they proved it uh, is by, by deriving uh, um, asymptotic expansion for any gradient correlation, and then using correlation inequalities, they infer from the, uh, for instance, from the, the gradient two-point correlation, they infer an information about uh, the spontaneous magnetization. They don't have a direct proof for the spontaneous magnetization. And because of this, uh, their method uh, is restricted to n equal two. So there is an intrinsic problem in extending their method to uh, n equal three or more. And actually, um, uh, someone, Lib in particular, uh, thought that there may be some uh, intrinsic problem, a bit like in two dimensions, you expect qualitatively something different for n equal three or more. He thought maybe our method breaks down because there is something happening for, for three or more components. Actually, this is not the case. Uh, and today I would like to report uh, a progress uh, uh, on the on a result of this sort for three or more components. Uh, and actually our method uh, is just, uh, it's an improvement, uh, improvement of their ideas. But uh, um, uh, at the end of the day, uh, the, the idea of Brickmon and collaborators works even for n equal three or more with, uh, with uh, appropriate modifications. As I said, uh, uh, Brickmon and company don't uh, derive uh, uh, sharp bounds on critical exponent, but uh, using correlation inequalities uh, that are valid for n equal to and not for uh, n equal three or more, they get uh, upper and lower bounds on the um, uh, so-called uh, transverse and truncated longitudinal correlations. For the transverse uh, correlation, they, they have upper and lower bounds with the same critical exponent. Uh, so they prove that the decay is uh, the same as the green function in three dimensions. Uh, for the truncated uh, longitudinal correlation, they have different exponent uh, in the upper and lower bounds. The correct exponent uh, by, uh, predicted by spin wave theory is this one, but the, so far, as far as I know, there is no proof. Uh, there is no upper bound with the same, uh, with the same exponent. And this is another uh, open problem in the list uh, that uh, I think would be interesting to, to, to prove. Um, okay, so in three or more dimension, there is, uh, so far the, the, there were no results on the low temperature expansion for M of meta modulo, uh, the, the, the one that can be extracted by Balaban. Uh, notice that, uh, that, that the ratio of the difficulty, so Balaban's work is a, is a series of eight or nine works, each of 80 pages. The, the, the proof of Brickmon and company is like 15 pages. So it's, it's really more readable. So you, you get less in the sense that you, do, you, you, don't, you don't get control on the decay exponents, but the, the proof of uh, the asymptotic nature of the low temperature expansion is much, much easier. So our main result that I would like to uh, present today is uh, essentially the same uh, that I just wrote for any n larger or equal than three. Uh, this result is valid for d larger or equal than three. Um, okay, these coefficients uh, depend on the dimension and on the number of components, but they are explicit. So there is a algorithm uh, that is the standard uh, 
uh, if you like, like standard uh, formal spin wave uh, expansion that uh, produces uh, these uh, uh, the, the, the coefficients. Okay, similar claim is valid for any um, uh, spin sp multi point spin spin correlation at fixed position. So if you fix the position, you can repeat the argument, uh, but uh, this method will give you uh, a remainder that uh, is independent of the position of, 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 the, uh, of the spin. So if you want to compute, for instance, the two point function, you, you can do it, the truncated two point function, whatever, you get. Uh, uh, for any n, uh, you, 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 you get explicit coefficients that will decay with the right uh, behavior, plus a remainder that is uh, uh, independent of position. So will tell you nothing about uh, asymptotic decay of correlations, unfortunately. Our proof, uh, as the one of Brickmon and company, uses uh, reflection positivity. So it's uh, required to, uh, we, we, we need the nearest neighbor interactions, contrary to the method of Balaban. So the method of Balaban is much, much heavier, but is more flexible. It, uh, it uh, allows for non-nearest uh, non neighbor interactions. Uh, so you can take fi any finite range ferromagnetic interaction, for instance. And it provides asymptotic for, for correlation, but the cost is uh, factor uh, whatever forty in <laughs> the number of pages. Um, so our strategy generalizes the one of Brickmon and collaborators, as I mentioned. The basic idea that I will try to review in some uh, detail in the following uh, is um, uh, to use Gaussian integration by parts. Uh, plus certain a priori bounds on the moments uh, that allow us to control the remainder. And uh, these a priori uh, bounds on the moments uh, are due to reflection positivity. So in principle, uh, uh, if, you can if you find a way to, uh, to, to get uh, a priori bounds on the moments uh, of the variables bypassing reflection positivity, you could apply the same ideas. But uh, OK, so far, nobody knows how, how to derive this a priori bound unless uh, uh, you use reflection positivity. Uh, at least in a soft way. So what is the difference compared to um, uh, Brickmon uh, and collaborators? So as I mentioned, the, the, the key is to, to find a, an inductive scheme uh, in the um, inductive scheme in the uh, uh, precision uh, in the precision n and in the um, uh, in, in, in the uh, degree of the monomial in the spin you, we, we are considering. Um, um, so an inductive scheme to control non-gradient observables, in particular the one-point function uh, giving the magnetization. I, on top of that, in, in order to, to, to get this control on non-gradient observable, we need uh, some a priori bounds uh, on uh, moments uh, uh, of, of the form uh, phi x to the p, phi y to the q with p and q odd that decay at large separation. So we use reflection positivity also to get some uh, a priori bounds uh, on the average of, of observable uh, of this sort that, that we need to uh, insert uh, inductively in the inductive scheme. So uh, I, I imagine that for the moment this uh, is uh, not, not, very, <laughs> not, not really transparent, but uh, in, the, uh, in the rest of the talk, I will try to, to, to really give uh, uh, details about uh, the, the strategy of proof. So uh, from now on, I would like to, to, to pass to a more technical uh, discussion. So if you have any questions about the main result uh, on or context, uh, it's, a, it's a good uh, moment. OK, if not, uh, I, I go on. But uh, please uh, stop me uh, at any moment. Uh, so the main steps uh, are the following. So first of all, uh, to, in order to to, to explain uh, the, the, um, the uh, essential to motivate some of the things uh, we, we will be doing some of the definition I need to, to briefly review the formal expansion the formal low temperature expansion what I call uh, what I refer to as the spin wave uh, expansion um, uh, so I, I need to briefly review the um, the a priori uh, bounds on the moments uh, following from reflection positivity that I just mentioned um, uh, and uh, uh, using uh, these uh, a priori bounds uh, uh, and integration by parts uh, in the uh, in uh, um, suitable representation of the uh, of the Gibbs measure, we uh, we obtain uh, a, a basic recursion formula for the 
for the correlation function that uh, we, we, we use uh, inductively so to, uh, to obtain the desired, uh, the desired uh, statement. Uh, if uh, time permitting, I would like to describe the induction procedure at lowest non-trivial order. Let's see if I, if I get to that point. Okay, so uh, um, um, I will, in order to describe uh, everything, I will focus on the case of three dimension and, and three, um, uh, n equal three. So the case of the classical Eisenberg model. The, uh, the proof uh, modulo slightly more cumbersome formulas for, works for any d larger or equal than three, any n larger or equal than three. So the, the main ideas are really, are really here. So we have three component spins, uh, and I, uh, I use uh, this, uh, um, uh, this representation here for the, uh, for, the, for, uh, for the spins. So I use this coordinates, uh, u theta coordinates. So I, I identify S1 with uh, this, uh, this variable called u, and um, the, the S2, S3 components uh, are uh, sine of theta, cosine of theta times uh, a radio, radius that depends on u. So the, um, in terms of these coordinates, uh, you, you, um, the, the, the uniform measure on the sphere is mapped uh, on, uh, onto a uniform measure in uh, u and theta. Okay, this, this, this essentially this is uh, uh, cosine of phi. So in, in terms of the spherical coordinates, u is uh, cosine of phi and, uh, uh, and, and theta is, uh, is theta. <laughs> okay, so in these coordinates, this is just a rewriting, the Hamiltonian becomes this one. So there is, uh, uh, UU term, and then there is a cosine of uh, uh, the discrete gradient, uh, discrete gradient of theta with uh, in front uh, this uh, this prefactor here. So I'm using uh, uh, the following uh, notations. So the the, the this uh, discrete gradient of i of theta x is nothing but uh, theta of x plus uh, e i minus theta x. I will sometimes write uh, uh, nabla uh, with this label i of theta x, or uh, sometimes I will I will use the I, I will write the the x uh, next to the nabla, whatever. I mean, this is just uh, notation wise. Okay, um, the. Um, it's very natural um, uh, since the, the measure is uh, e to the minus beta uh, that thing. So you see that if you multiply everything by beta, it's natural to rescale uh, u and theta by a, a square root of beta in, uh, in this way here. So uh, I introduce rescaled variables u tilde and phi, um, uh, in terms of which uh, the, the, um, the partition function corresponding with the Gibbs measure uh, uh, takes uh, this form here. So there is some, uh, uh, so the, the constraint uh, ux smaller or equal than one, and phi of x smaller equal than pi uh, become, is rescaled by a square root of beta. Remember that beta is very large, so this, uh, this now becomes uh, a, a pretty soft uh, uh, constraint, uh, looking at it in this way. Uh, the, 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 the measure in the phi is uh, uh, e to the minus one half uh, gradient phi squared, which is the, the, the dominant, if you like, Gaussian approximation, plus uh, uh, correction that are at least order t. And then there is also uh, a part depending on you. Let me uh, write what it is. So um, H of U tilde is just the rescaled version of this, U tilde, U tilde, uh, plus, uh, uh, well, the rescaled version of this uh, term, term, term here. Uh, to, to derive this formula, you should imagine to, to add and subtract the minus one to the, to the cosine here. So I collected together the, um, the phi independent terms that I collected here. And then uh, I have the correction to the gradient part that are written here. Okay, you, you don't really need to, 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 to look at the details. The important thing is that the, this, uh, the, this W beta is uh, at least of order T in, uh, in a formal expansion in, uh, in the temperature. So, um, Remember, here I'm trying to, 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 to review uh, briefly uh, one possible form of the formal low temperature expansion for uh, correlations. Okay so, um, okay, so you can write very explicitly the, the, um, the, the, the correction here to the... Okay, maybe, maybe, maybe let me write it here. So... Uh, 
z is equal to so the partition function lambda integral ux smaller equal than square root of beta d u tilde e to the h u tilde integral d phi phi x smaller equal than pi square root of beta e to the minus one half plus this uh, w beta u tilde uh, phi where h tilde is that and w beta is the other thing Okay, in W beta, you can write uh, an explicit expansion. You don't really need to, to, to look uh, at the details. A very important thing is that uh, the phi dependence of this W in, is in the form of a gradient. So uh, the W beta is a gradient interaction in the phi, but a non-gradient interaction in the U. So somehow the, the problem in Brickmon and company that they had a method that was intrinsically designed to control um, to control only gradient observables. So if you don't have the U, the U, which is the case for, for rotators, everything is a gradient observable and you can bypass uh, the study of non-gradient uh, observable. As soon as you have three or more components, uh, you're sort of forced by, by life to, to consider non-gradient uh, terms. So this is, uh, this is the thing. Okay, the formal low temperature expansion is obtained by uh, formally expanding in T this exponential and uh, in forgetting this constraint here. So if you forget about this constraint and you expand formal in T, you get what is called the, as the formal uh, spin wave expansion. They, uh, actually, it's uh, relatively easy to show via reflection positivity that the effect of these uh, constraints here is exponentially small in beta. So it does not affect uh, Neglecting this constraint it does not affect uh, the, the low temperature expansion at any finite order n. So um, uh, let me be slightly more explicit about uh, um, uh, about the the form of the um, um, formal spin wave expansion. So um, if you forget about uh, the, the these constraints. Uh, the average of any observable uh, f calligraphic uh, f is uh, given by this uh, this measure here and can be rewritten in the form uh, written up there so here uh, in the notation i'm using here um, straight f is a function of phi uh, calligraphic f is a function of u, u tilde and uh, um, the average can be thought of as an average with respect to a, an appropriate measure in the U tilde of uh, something involving a measure, an average uh, of F. The, the, the average of F is essentially this, uh, this modified Gaussian, uh, Gaussian integration. And you can expand it uh, in, in very standard way in, uh, in terms of uh, by, by expanding the W and uh, the, the, by expanding the, the W downstairs and then expanding the W in T. It's not really important uh, the, 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 that you uh, check the details, so you follow the details. This just to show that uh, the low temperature expansion is very explicit. I mean, it's something uh, uh, that, that you can really write down at any finite order via a, a simple procedure. And the other uh, thing that I would like to that you, you to appreciate is that once again, the, the dependence on the phi's is only in terms of these of this gradients, okay? So this, uh, um, the, uh, this is uh, the, the formal expansion at all orders. Of course, you can truncate it at any finite order and obtain, uh, in the obtain an, an expression for the end order truncation of any correlation function. This is, uh, uh, if you like, the, the, um, uh, the formula. In this uh, formula, this, uh, um, this uh, symbol E for the expectation stands for the expectation with respect to the, to the Gaussian measure E to the minus one half. Uh, so uh, expectation, uh, this expectation is, uh, with respect, is an expectation with respect to phi uh, with respect to the measure
So it's just with respect to this uh, to this measure here. Okay, this should be interpreted with a caveat. Uh, of course, uh, written like this, this is just uh, ill-defined because uh, it's uh, it's a gradient thing. But uh, you can uh, whatever uh, add the small mass, uh, take make the computation, remove the mass, or things of this sort. So this, uh, in any case, this is an this e here is an explicit Gaussian average. What is non-explicit in this expression a priori is the is the uh, average uh, with respect to the u tildes, which is uh, the way I, I, I wrote it is, uh, is, uh, is still complicated because uh, the average with respect to u, the u tilde is with respect to this uh, non, um, uh, non Gaussian weight uh, here. Okay, so this formula here relates the nth order truncation of any uh, observable in the form of a monomial in the phi and monomial in the uh, in the u tilde uh, to this uh, expression here. Notice that uh, in this uh, uh, term here, the truncation at order n is related to a truncation of lower order. So this uh, can be easily. Uh, so if we only add this term, we could use an induction uh, in, 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 in iterative procedure to compute uh, explicitly the, the right side. Uh, here, unfortunately, there is the same order uh, of precision as the left side. On the other hand, um, we know that, uh, um, th that the model is rotational invariant in the components one, two. So we are, remember, we are studying a situation in which the, um, uh, the magnetic field, before removing it uh, to, to zero plus, uh, was in the third direction. So the one and two components uh, uh, have uh, by construction rotational invariant. So we know a priori that the average of anything, uh, um, uh, sorry, here uh, th there is another typo. The, here there should not be uh, any phi. So what I want to say is that uh, for the purpose, uh, if you have an observable on the depending on u tilde, You can replace it uh, by by the corresponding expression uh, by the corresponding expression uh, in the utility phi of the so th this would be the first component. This would be the second, uh, the second component that uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in probability sense is the same uh, as u tilde. And now you can uh, here, you, you see that uh, the expression down here is equal to phi of x plus uh, order t. So this is the same as, uh, so a dominant order, this is uh, just a monomial in phi of x, uh, which a dominant order, uh, is given just uh, as average equal to the Gaussian average plus uh, correction of order t. So uh, in other words, uh, from this formula, um, uh, using rotational invariance plus uh, uh, a finite number of iterations, you can compute explicitly the, 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 the nth order truncation of the low temperature expansion for any monomial in phi and u tilde. Um, Again, uh, if you didn't follow the details, this is fine because this, uh, these formulas are, are, are too big. The message is that you have a, a very explicit procedure to, to compute any finite truncation of the low temperature expansion for any correlation. And uh, this uh, expansion involves only gradients uh, uh, in the files up to possibly a non-gradient dependence in the observable F uh, uh, that I'm averaging here. Okay, so this uh, um, somehow concludes uh, the brief review of what uh, uh, formal uh, spin wave theory predicts uh, for, uh, uh, for the low temperature expansion of, of any observable. Now, let me um, uh, discuss uh, um, uh, briefly the, the moments control induced by re, um, implied by reflection positivity. So as I also reviewed this morning in the mini course uh, I, I gave, uh, um, uh, reflection positivity allows one to get a lower bound on the uh, spontaneous magnetization. Here, uh, there is another type, or this should be, there should be a label three uh, 
uh, up here in the S0. So the, third, the average of the third component of the spin at zero is bounded from below by one minus something uh, smaller than one at low temperatures. And uh, actually, um, uh, reflection positivity also uh, implies uh, a, an exponential form of the bound in, in, in this uh, way here. So take any F of finite support uh, and consider the uh, average of the exponential of uh, uh, F against uh, uh, S minus the average of S. Uh, this is smaller than this um, uh, e to the one over two beta of F G F. G is the uh, um, green function of the um, uh, lattice Laplacian in dimension D. And this is uh, uh, an immediate consequence of what is called the Gaussian domination, which is a consequence of reflection positivity. Okay, this uh, uh, exponential form of the, uh, of the bound uh, readily implies uh, that uh, any moment of U tilde uh, or phi is bounded uh, um, uh, in some independent way, but uh, um, um, uh, by something independent of beta uh, for any uh, power n. So all the moments are bounded a priori independently of beta. Uh, this is true for the phi zeros. This is true for the uh, u tildes. Uh, one also finds uh, that uh, uh, the probability that uh, theta is, uh, is on the boundary so this, uh, these delta terms uh, are the terms that you pick up uh, in the integration by parts formula that I will discuss soon uh, when uh, the derivative uh, uh, falls onto the uh, integration uh, uh, boundary. So these terms are exponentially small. So this is to say that essentially you can forget about this, uh, these constraints uh, in, the, in, in, in the following. Um, so to, to see, that uh, a formula of this sort uh, implies uh, uh, very easily bounds on the moments. Uh, uh, let me maybe um, uh, let me maybe uh, maybe just comment a second about this. Uh, so, for instance, to see that uh, the formula up there implies uh, uh, a simple bound on the moments of u tilde, uh, do the following. So, choose uh, uh, f up there to be. Um, uh, F to be uh, square root of uh, beta um, delta x zero uh, one zero zero. So if you do so, you get uh, that. Uh, um, so if you replace this choice of F uh, up there, you get uh, uh, e to the um, e to the uh, square root of uh, beta. Um, u x zero. Um, uh, smaller equal than what? Then e to the one half g x zero x zero. But g x zero x zero by the translational invariance is the same as g zero zero, and this is uh, this is finite. Now this thing uh, here is nothing but uh, u tilde of x zero, and so now you 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 just uh, expand exponential uh, in powers and you get uh, exactly that formula. So th th this is larger than the than the average of the n term, and uh, and you get that formula. So it's really this to show that the, uh, actually these moments bounds are really uh, an immediate corollary of the reflection positivity or Gaussian diminution estimate. So wh wh why it's good to have this, um, these a priori bounds on the moments? Because now we can, uh, um, we, 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 we can uh, apply integration by parts formula at a finite order and get a priori bounds on the remainder using this, uh, this uh, a priori bounds on the moments. So imagine that you want to uh, evaluate uh, uh, um, the average of an observable of, of, of this form. So this is, uh, if, you if you just uh, recall uh, what is the, 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 the formula uh, for the Gibbs measure, you can rewrite it this way. So there is some dependence on u tilde, and then there is uh, integral over d phi uh, of uh, some uh, Gaussian reference measure, then the, the, the interaction of order t, and then uh, the, the observable you, you want here. 
Here, for convenience, uh, I'm, I add and subtract a mass term that, uh, uh, well, I want to do so. And now I want to uh, integrate by parts uh, this uh, phi x naught with respect to this reference, uh, reference Gaussian measure. So I, I, I just use integration by parts. When you use integration by parts, uh, what happens? Uh, so you integrate by parts. There are some boundary terms uh, in which uh, phi is, uh, uh, is, um, is equal to plus minus pi square root of beta. These are the terms uh, of this sort here, and these are exponentially small. What do you have next? Then you have terms in which the derivatives uh, either uh, falls onto this uh, m squared phi squared term, this is, uh, um, oh no, sorry. The dominant term is when the derivative uh, falls onto the phi to the p, and this is uh, the, this term here. Then there is, uh, the, the, when in, by integrating by parts, there is some derivative uh, uh, falling onto the term uh, like this, uh, and this is uh, uh, the origin of this second term here. And then there is the derivative uh, uh, acting on this w beta, and this is the third term, okay? So this is just an identity. Uh, the moments bounds tell us that, uh, uh, first of all, this boundary term is exponentially small and also tells us that this term here, so we have some uh, a priori bounds on this guy. Here we have the summation of, uh, of, of a massive uh, uh, green function that scales like one over M. So tells us that this term here is of order M. So um, remember that in three dimensions, uh, uh, the green function uh, the case at large distance is like one over uh, x minus y, uh, and uh, corresponding the gradient decays like one over uh, distance squared, the gradient squared like one over distance cubed. Uh, Gm here is uh, is uh, is a version of this uh, uh, cut off at scale m, so it's uh, sort of the Yukawa uh, green function. So uh, this summation essentially, is, so if you bound this by a constant. This summation here is, uh, um, uh, uh, is cut off the, uh, uh, at scale M. Um, uh, no, actually, if you do this, sorry. No, if you do this way, actually, you, you, you find the bound. No, sorry. If you bound things this way, you, you, you get just a constant out of this. So you, you have to, to, do, to get something better. You, you need the to get some decay bound out of, out of this in order to, to prove that this term is, uh, is small in M. And this is actually uh, part, of the, part of the game. So if you fix uh, M sufficiently small and expand W uh, in T up to order N, we find uh, this uh, first basic uh, um, uh, integration by part lemma. Uh, that is one of the main ingredients uh, uh, of the story. So once again, in, in order to, to prove this, uh, we are sort of just integrating by parts uh, and uh, uh, bounding the remainders, uh, thanks to the moments bound I showed, plus some improved uh, moments bound that I will uh, state in a moment. Uh, so uh, actually these are, sorry, these are the, uh, the, the, um, the extra statement you, you need in the proof of, the, of lemma one. So you need that, uh, uh, when you have uh, two groups uh, uh, of uh, um, uh, phi to a odd power, phi to an odd power, there is decay in the distance between the two groups. And this is something you need uh, in order to bound uh, uh, this term here. Okay, once again, uh, I imagine that uh, in order to really enter into the details, we would need uh, some more time. But uh, nothing particularly special. So the point is that you use Gaussian integration by parts, and you use the a priori bounds induced by reflection positivity to estimate rigorously the remainder. So this is uh, this is what you get. So this, uh, in the case uh, in which you have uh, to integrate by parts uh, 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 a single field phi, when you have to integrate by parts a gradient, uh, which is something you, you, you happen to do when, uh, when, you, when, when you intend to iterate uh, the story, you get an improved uh, um, bound on the remainder that decays uh, in the distance between the position of this uh, phi and the position of the other, uh, uh, and the position of the other files. So this is uh, uh, one uh, improve, technical improvement compared to, to, to what Brickmon and company did. So somehow we get uh, for, for uh, uh, gradient integration by parts, uh, we obtain improved uh, 
uh, estimate compared to the naive ones uh, you, you would get by, by, by a simple uh, uh, um, iteration of the integration by part formula. Okay, now uh, we have all the ingredients to, um, to obtain to, for setting up the induction to compute, uh, say, the magnetization at any given order. So in the last uh, five, 10 minutes, uh, uh, tell me if I, if I can, can do something more than five. Uh, I, I, I wanted to, to, to try to illustrate at the blackboard uh, how to use these lemmas to compute uh, uh, the magnetization at uh, precision T squared. So up to an error term uh, of smaller order compared to T squared. So the idea, um, so the procedure is the following. So uh, start from the e expression of, uh, of S30 in terms of U tilde and phi. So this is the exact formula and you can tailor expand in T up to the precision you need. So you compute, uh, uh, you have a term of order t, a term of order t square, and the remainder. The remainder is bounded a priori thanks to the mo uh, a priori bounds on the moments induced by reflection positivity. So uh, um, uh, this order t cubed really becomes something smaller than constant t cubed as soon as you evaluate the average. So here, uh, these terms here, you can slightly simplify using rotational invariance. So the average of u tilde squared uh, can be rewritten in terms of uh, uh, average of, of, uh, um, of observable involving uh, phi zero. So uh, this uh, using rotational invariance, you immediately get that the average of u tilde squared is uh, phi zero, the average of phi zero squared plus uh, these uh, terms, uh, average of phi zero to the fourth, uh, phi zero squared, u tilde squared. And similarly, the, the average of this is uh, the average of phi zero for up to uh, higher order terms. Okay, so now you have, uh, 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 in conclusion, you have this, uh, um, uh, this expression here that uh, readily follows from uh, expansion of this expression uh, in, in Taylor series in T plus, uh, in order to prove this, uh, the, the a priori bound on the, uh, on the moments of uh, phi zero and u tilde. Okay, so far and, and nothing uh, particularly special. Now we want to find the procedure to evaluate explicitly this, this thing up to a precision uh, T squared. And so to do this, uh, we apply uh, iteratively uh, lemma one and lemma three that I, uh, I, I, I showed uh, above. Okay. Uh, well, actually, I realized that uh, so the, the, the discussion of this would not take uh, more than uh, 10 minutes, but maybe this would be a, a, a bit uh, too long and too technical for, uh, for the, the, the whole audience. So um, let me actually um, uh, skip this. Uh, and uh, if uh, anybody's interested, uh, even one person is interested afterwards, I can spend 10 minutes after the end of the talk. Maybe, maybe this is better. Um, so it, it, the, the, there is a simple uh, um, uh, two-step uh, application of the, of the integration by part lemmas, uh, uh, lemma one, lemma three, to, to really compute uh, this, uh, these averages here. And you, you, in, in this uh, specific case, you get this uh, explicit expression for the uh, a linear term in T and the quadratic term in T. But the, the, the procedure can be clearly uh, iterated at any order. This clearly is not uh, actually, if you really want to write it down, it's not so uh, straightforward. Actually, we, we realized how to prove this at second order several uh, um, uh, months ago. And then we, we struggled in, uh, in finding uh, an explicit inductive hypothesis to prove this at, uh, at any order N. So the general hypo uh, inductive hypothesis that at the end uh, we, 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 success, uh, we uh, successfully uh, proved uh, is the following. is an induction both in the precision n and uh, in, the, uh, in the degree of the monomial we intend to uh, evaluate the, the, the average of. And actually we need two different uh, parts of the inductive statement. One is for non-gradient uh, observables and one is for gradient observables. And the, the part with the gradient observable as an improved, uh, as an improved uh, um, uh, decay here that is needed uh, uh, in an iterative way is needed also to prove uh, uh, item one. 
So somehow uh, the, the, the general induction is, uh, is, uh, is a bit more technical, but uh, the, the, the discussion of, the, of this computation at second order is uh, pretty um, uh, illustrative of what uh, really things, uh, how things go. Okay, let me at this point conclude. And then uh, once again, uh, if uh, anybody uh, wants to, 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 to follow the, the discussion uh, offline, I'm very happy to do it. So um, summary of what I discussed. So the method of Brickmon, Fontaine, uh, Leibovitz, Lieben, and Spencer uh, uh, dating back to 1981, uh, where uh, Brickmon and collaborator proved the, the validity, the asymptotic nature of the low temperature expansion for the gradient observables of the classical rotator model in three or more dimensions can be adapted to n vector models with n larger equal than three. So the, I, um, uh, the, the, I stated the, the result explicitly for the magnetization, but the, the same result holds for multi-point spin correlation at fixed, uh, at fixed positions. The proof requires reflection positivity to, to get a priori bounds uh, on the moments uh, of, uh, of u tilde and phi. And these a priori bounds are, are needed to, to, to get uh, an a priori control on the remainder in an integration by parts formula that is used uh, iteratively to, to generate the low temperature expansion. There are plenty of open problems. Uh, let me su summarize some of the most important uh, ones. In three dimensions, uh, it would be very nice to get uh, um, uh, to, to compute or at least estimate uh in a realistic way the the um, decay exponents uh, for the um uh, algebraic decay of uh, transverse spin spin correlation and truncated longitudinal spin spin correlations in two dimensions uh, it would be nice to 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 get uh, uh, a lower bound alpha frelick frelick spencer with algebraic decay but with the right exponent or at least uh, the right order in beta of the exponent uh, now we the, the upper and lower bounds obtained by mcbrian spencer and frelick and spencer uh, uh, don't ma don't match not even at the order uh, in beta the, the upper bound uh, involves uh, uh, an exponent uh, order one over beta and the other one uh, one over say square root of beta the other very big open problem is the proof of exponential decay of spin-spin correlation in two dimensions and three or more uh, um, components of the spin. Even more challenging uh, uh, open problems concern the, the quantum case. Uh, in the quantum case, in three dimensions, it's known that uh, the, the quantum rotator model, the quantum XY model, has spontaneous magnetization. Uh, and uh, uh, again, a reflection positivity is used uh, to, to prove that, but there is uh, no, um, uh, no information about uh, uh, decay of correlations. Uh, so the, um, uh, the, it would be nice to get uh, upper and lower bounds a la Brickmon and company in the quantum case. Uh, this is uh, open as far as I know. Even uh, more importantly, would be one would uh, like to, to, to prove existence of spontaneous magnetization for the quantum Heisenberg uh, ferromagnet. Uh, this is uh, a very big uh, open question, so unproven by any method. So there is no one cannot we, we cannot even appeal to a series of Balaban's paper or whatever to, to say. So nobody knows how to prove this, and it would be, I think, very important for mathematical physics uh, to, 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 to settle this question. And I think uh, I'm done. Thank you very much for the attention. OK, thank you, Alessandro, for this effort to present a question. Uh, does Balaban say uh, uh, explicitly what you found? Or? Sorry, Rico, can you speak with the microphone a bit closer? Uh, does Balaban uh, state the results you you wrote? Down? Yeah, I, I I think so. Uh, I mean, so it uh, agrees. Well, yeah, I, <laughs> yes. In in the sense, uh, he, he says that you 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 can compute at any finite order. Uh, that, I mean, it's clear that. Uh, uh, the, the, the expansion you get, if you prove it's correct, uh, is the one of uh, uh, is the formal one. I mean, I, I, I didn't check the way in which he states it, but th there is a part eight, part nine, in which he, he, he says that uh, uh, he, he proves in particular, he derives uh, an asymptotic expansion for, for M of beta. 
and uh, okay, it must coincide. I mean, uh, <laughs> I don't know how. how it, um... So yeah. we we made an effort. Uh, I I don't know if uh, I, I guess this was not. Uh, uh, I'm not sure it was uh, how understandable it was, but. Uh, this formula here gives you really a, an explicit algorithm to compute any truncation. I, I'm not sure that uh, Balaban uh, states uh, the result uh, with such an explicit form, but uh, it must be the same, whatever. I, uh... Uh, other questions? Uh, I have one. So yes. uh, in the expansions you did, I somehow lost the dependence on the volume. So is no, uh, the, 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 the way in which I stated everything is without volume. Of course, we, we could do things with the volume. I don't know, this, this was a preference of my code or more than, so we- so It is hidden some you know, the no, well, Gaussian uh, uh, Well, uh, at, at slide two, I said that uh, we are only, we, we are studying this, uh, this, this measure, which is already an infinite volume measure. So you know that, uh, you know a priori that, uh, uh, possibly passing uh, uh, to subsequences uh, an infinite volume uh, uh, limit uh, and uh, zero field limit exists uh, and is ergodic. This is by some uh, uh, correlation inequalities for n smaller or equal than four, or for n larger than four, you can again use reflection positivity to prove this. So the um, uh, so once you know that this uh, um, this uh, finite volume measure is reflection positive, uh, you get that the, also the limit uh, is reflection positive, and, and all the bounds I discussed uh, hold for the. Um, in in the in another point where the the finite volume enters is when you prove uh, is when you prove uh, the integration by parts formula. So. If you uh, if you want to be serious about this, uh, you you have to first uh, write the integration by part in finite volume with everything uh, with uh, all the cutoffs. Uh, you, you you derive uh, a formula of this sort in finite volume, and you take uh, limits on both sides, and you get uh, at the end of the day you you get uh, a result which only involves the averages of the of the infinite volume measure. Okay, but so the, the, somehow it's hidden in the fact that uh, here and there we take uh, infinite volume limits uh, after having taken the the, the averages. But we of, could uh, have done also in the other. Place. I think we could have done everything keeping the volume uh, fixed uh, forever, and then uh, uh, yeah. But okay, but the control of the error in finite volume is not so explicit. We just know that uh, the limit exists and, and things of this sort. Okay. Uh, other questions. Okay. Yeah, uh, maybe that. And that yeah. So just a, 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 a simple, before a simple question, your method uh, works. Uh, you need the nearest neighbor interaction. Yes. Just. Maybe you can point out. Can you point out wh where it enters this fact? And then uh, here. Another... Oh. So this is very important. So the this bound here, from which uh, we get uh, this a priori uh, bound on the moments, which is crucial to control all the remainders. Uh, is valid only if the uh, interaction is nearest neighbor. This is because uh, this bound here uh, called Gaussian domination, uh, it follows from reflection positivity. And reflection positivity breaks down as soon as you consider, so say you take a ferromagnetic interaction in which you have a dominant nearest neighbor interaction plus uh, a small uh, extra ferromagnetic term uh, next to nearest neighbor. Then you know that there exist a Fs for which this is violated. Of course, uh, it could be that uh, for the Fs uh, you need, uh, this is still valid, uh, and uh, but then you don't know how to prove it. So the, the, the point is that there is a sort of magical uh, positivity property for which uh, this is true for all Fs, uh, but only if it's nearest neighbor. Well, it's not only. Nearest neighbor is okay, and also infinite range uh, with the appropriate kernels. What is not okay is to have a finite range uh, with range larger than one. So it's known that if you have finite range with range larger than one, uh, this uh, inequality is violated for some f. There exists f for which this is violated. But even this, the existence of this f is not very, so you know it's not true, but uh, 
it may be that it's violated by very strange Fs. I mean, uh, it's not so constructive. Uh, the... And, uh, another question more general. In the Ising model, you can derive several information on the model by this uh, random cluster model. Uh, is a model uh, that these are uh, so random graphs uh, with some. And for such generalization, do you have some such, some representation like this or not? Yes, there are some representation, uh, not uh, as. Uh, um, um, not as uh, uh, useful or uh, um, uh, okay. Yes, there are representations, uh, but uh, uh, the, 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 this, this representation. Uh, uh, so the, the the useful feature of this representation is to prove that in sufficiently large dimension, things go uh, in the same way as. Uh, um as the 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 as mean field theory predicts so they, they are very useful to prove uh, um, um, um uh, how is it called this uh, um um okay it's uh yeah i don't remember the name so the, the, there is this expansion that uh, uh, so you, you can write identities involving certain uh, random walks representation of multi-component things but to get useful bounds out of it uh, you need to be in high dimension so the, people use this uh, to prove uh, that uh, for sufficiently large dimension things go like in mean field and now they push this bounds uh, in, in, uh, in a quite sophisticated way up to dimension uh, six maybe even five so up to really the uh, initially these methods only work for d larger than uh, 50 whatever but uh, in in low dimension like in in dimension uh, two or three i mean this this uh, representation are, are not are not very useful as far as i know and the, the, these representations are di are due to frelick as usual uh, bridges uh, sokal uh, i don't know may maybe rico has uh, comments about uh, the use I, I i confess i never use these uh, representations for um uh for 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 for, uh, for these models other questions okay so let's thank alessandro for both the lectures and uh, the seminar and all his efforts to bring to us all this material okay so thank you okay you're welcome and uh, since a few participants online would be interested to to the proof that alessandro like and not the time to do maybe i propose we can do a five minutes break yes and for, then, for me it's uh, fine i don't want to to 15 past four we just resume the, with the people that would be interesting to follow in particular yeah. the one online and uh Seren, actually i didn't ask if there were questions from online no you are there were questions from the audience online. uh they wanted uh -huh. to see the proof yes the ah, ah, they wanted to, online, oh, okay. they wanted ah, to see the good. proof uh, yeah I, so maybe just in five minutes for whatever okay we, well, okay perfect so i had switch off the audio from the line so we say hello to everyone uh, maybe online. yeah just for five minutes uh. yeah uh, oh i can switch off the the microphone here yes i i, I close here
Why? Riscrivo delle formule che erano già scritte poco fa. Allora, eh, Serena, riprendo? Sì, 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 sì. Okay. sei già online. Ok, perfetto. Allora, dico, riprendo dal, di, da, da, da questa espressione. Diciamo che per illustrare la procedura di, di, eh, che usiamo, eh, eh, dic diciamo che voglio calcolare la magnetizzazione a ordine T quadro, a precisione T quadro, cioè quindi a meno di errori di ordine più piccolo di T quadro. Ehm... Eh, L'idea è di eh, vabbè, espandere dove possibile in, in serie di Taylor in T, stimare i resti dove possibile eh, con eh, le, le stime a priori sui, eh, sui momenti e, e, e poi usare in, integrazione per parti. Cioè, questo lemma qua è la, eh, è la sua controparte per, eh, per l'integrazione eh, 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 per parti in presenza di, di un di un osservabile gradiente. Allora qua eh, notate che nell'integrazione per parti io qua sto in integrando rispetto a phi x0, quindi se integro per parti pesco un propagatore che mi va da una funzione di green che mi va da x0 a y eh, e, e y è la posizione del, del campo rispetto a cui sto derivando. Questo è, è, è il primo termine che, che, che pesco quando, uh, quando faccio quando derivo nella formula di integrazione per parti e poi c'è il termine dovuto all'interazione quello in cui la, la derivata casca sul termine di interazione questi sono eh, termini che, che vanno come t a una certa potenza se io voglio troncare al, eh, se io voglio ottenere informazioni eh, a, a ordine n devo troncare questa serie a ordine n il resto grazie al controllo a priori sui eh, sorry I'm, I'm, I'm... I'm speaking in Italian, is it okay? <laughs> I, I don't know, if we're all Italian, maybe it's okay. Uh, uh, there is a person non Italian in the online. Uh, uh, so, sorry. sorry, so you, you uh, I was just uh, not thinking. About. If it's Tobias, uh, is it? No, Italian? no, no, it's another student. And non Tobias. Uh, okay. Um, so I, um, uh, okay, so th this is the lemma one and there is a similar lemma three for the, For, for the gradient uh, uh, integration by parts. Um, okay, so the, the, the other, um, so let, 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 me, let me write the, this exactly in, in terms of the, um, uh, of its representation, uh, u tilde phi representation. Here I just expand at second order in T this uh, square root. Uh, at second order in T uh, this cosine and if you collect uh, things uh, you get uh, these explicit terms uh, plus a remainder that involves moments uh, of the form u tilde 0 to the 6 uh, phi 0 to the 6 uh, since we have uh, uh, si since we have a priori control on the moments we get T to the cubed times uh, a, a finite constant here okay so um, and now in this term so uh, so far so good Okay, now I, I, I want to compute uh, these terms here um, at uh, uh, precision uh, uh, of order zero, because we already have a T squared uh, in front, and these terms here at the precision one. Um, uh, what's the idea? The idea is to use the integration by part formula uh, at the corresponding truncation here. Um, uh, 
of course, if you want to integrate by parts, uh, you, need, uh, uh, you need some dependence uh, upon phi. So for instance, in this term, uh, in which you only have u tilde, you want to appeal to rotational invariance to reduce yourself to, to an observable depending on phi. So before we start using lemma one and lemma three, let me rewrite this u tilde, uh, u tilde zero. So remember that uh, the average of u tilde uh, zero squared is equal uh, by rotation invariance in the one to the, in the one two components to uh, beta one minus t u tilde zero squared uh, sine of square root of t phi zero squared. So this is just an identity coming from the fact that we can exchange the role of one and two uh, in, the, in the measure. Uh, now, this thing here, we can, uh, um, uh, since we're interested in computing this at a precision uh, t, we can expand this uh, uh, in Taylor series again up to order t. And um, OK, so the dominant term is the one in which I pick one here, and I pick uh, t phi 0 squared here. t and beta simplify. So this is equal to phi 0 squared uh, plus, uh, um, uh, let me see. Uh, actually, minus. Uh, if you do the computation, let me not uh, do the details. Uh, but uh, it's just uh, again Taylor expansion of this, and eh? not, nothing, nothing very deep. Uh, we get uh, uh, and then we get one third phi zero to the fourth, and then we uh, we get order t squared. Again, the fact that uh, this, this uh, remainder is, uh, const is bounded by constant t squared uh, uses, uh, uh, well, the remainder formula for the Taylor series plus the a priori uh, bound on the moments. Okay, so if you now, and then similarly, you get that uh, u tilde zero to the four that appears uh, here is equal to uh, phi zero to the four plus uh, order t. Okay, so if you plug uh, this, this expansion here and, uh, and the second formula here, you can rewrite uh, uh, this expression here in the following, uh, in the following form, which is, is the, actually the starting point of, uh, of the induction. Okay, to check the coefficients, uh, I mean, you, you, you can do it, uh, it's an exercise. Okay, and now you see that all the, the three different terms that we have here now have some uh, phi zero dependence, so we can apply lemma one. So we want to apply lemma one to each of these, uh, to each of these guys. Uh, the simpler, uh, so notice that uh, if you want to compute this thing here at a precision t squared, it's enough that we, uh, we compute uh, these two terms in parentheses at a precision zero, and this thing here at a precision one. So the easiest terms to compute uh, are, are uh, those at a precision zero, not surprisingly. So we have these uh, three terms, uh, one, two, and three. So the easiest terms to, to control are two and three. So let me start with those. Okay, so uh, let me start to say for, with the term two. So we have a five zero to the four. So now we apply lemma one. So we, we, and we want to apply lemma one at order zero. So we just have, so this term is not here. And uh, so we, we, we have in the right side, we just have this term here plus uh, order, um, uh, plus order T. I realize that there is another type of this should be the lemma one is valid with uh, uh, N plus one minus epsilon, but this is not uh, so serious. Um, so if you apply lemma one, 
uh, we get uh, um, actually G00 uh, times the, um, uh, well, three, three times uh, um, uh, average of five zero zero plus order. Uh, if you take it literally, uh, if you take it literally, it should be order T. It's actually T to the one minus epsilon. This is the truth. So this is just an application of lemma one. Now you, we have this other thing here. So here we apply again lemma one. From lemma one, uh, this is equal to G zero zero plus order T to the one minus epsilon. So you put things together and we get three times G zero zero squared plus order T one minus epsilon. And we are finished now, because if you plug this there, we get an error that is t to the three minus epsilon, which is fine. OK, the, 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 the term three is very similar. So you apply, um, you apply uh, lemma one, and you get this. Now you, um, you, you, so now you end up with something that depends on u tilde uh, zero and not on phi. So here you would like to reapply lemma one, but to do it, we have first to, to, to use uh, uh, rotational invariance. By rotational invariance, there is already observed that is equal to phi zero squared plus order t. So rotational invariance tells you that this is phi zero squared plus order t. And phi zero squared, if you apply lemma one again, is g zero z as already did, g zero zero plus order t to the one minus epsilon. So putting things together, we get g zero zero squared plus order t to the one minus epsilon. Okay, so this is, uh, this is done. We get uh, 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 three over, so in, in this expression here, so this is uh, this can be replaced by three over twelve uh, g zero zero squared plus uh, three quarters uh, g zero zero squared uh, plus uh, order t to the one minus epsilon. So the 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 two things together give you g zero zero squared plus uh, uh, negligible uh, contributions. So we are left with one. Okay, so what about the term one? So now the term one, we want to compute it at a precision uh, one, not at a precision zero. So we want to apply lemma one with uh, uh, truncation n equal one instead of n equal zero. So we apply lemma one. And if you do so, we get g zero zero. This is the contribution from the first term. Then we want to write uh, the uh, s equal one term uh, here. So we get plus uh, t uh, sum over x and i uh, gradient i x of uh, g zero. Something so th this means uh, that uh, this is a derivative acting on the variable uh, on the second variable. So this is, uh, if you like, uh, uh, the discrete gradient of g uh, zero comma x, uh, where the gradient acts on the second variable. Uh, and then we have uh, sum over j plus r equal to one of uh, uh, this c prime r is just uh, minus one to the r plus uh, r plus one to r plus one factorial. And then we have uh, what? We have uh, uh, phi zero uh, x phi to the two r plus one. Uh, what else? And then we, we, we have this uh, uh, G J 
x i. Okay, and I I I, um, uh, I just uh, recall uh, the formula for uh, so G zero. is equal to one and G one X I is equal to what is equal to, uh, I think minus one um, U tilde X squared plus U tilde X plus E I squared, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, ah, and there is a, there are also these factors here, uh, which is one half. So there is a. Okay. And I think uh, this is it. Okay. So so there are just uh, okay plus uh, plus what plus. Uh, order t to the two minus uh, uh, epsilon. Okay, so these terms uh, you, we can neglect, it gives uh, a negligible contribution, this is fine. And now we want to evaluate uh, the, this thing uh, at order zero, okay? So we already have uh, t here, another t here. So we want to compute this thing at the precision zero, okay? There are two terms, the term in which j is equal to one and r is equal to zero, and the term where j is equal to zero and r is equal to one. Okay, so there are uh, there are actually two terms. Huh? So the term with uh, r equal one and j uh, zero is just uh, um, one over six phi zero uh, derivative of phi to the power three. And then the term with uh, um, j equal one and r equal zero is uh, um, is uh, plus uh, uh, one half phi zero d i x phi times. Uh, um, u tilde x squared, so u tilde x plus e i squared. So these are the, the, the two terms. And now we want to evaluate this at order zero and this at order zero. So what's the idea? We just uh, reapply the integration by parts lemma uh, to, compute, uh, uh, to compute this thing here. Ah, uh, notice, sorry, I, I, I made something wrong. Here there is uh, in lemma one, there is, uh, uh, there is a, cutoff, uh, a cutoff mass here, which is chosen to be uh, T squared. Yeah, uh, maybe T, may maybe it's enough T in our, well, whatever. Let me choose it T squared to be on the safe side. Okay, now we want to, um, to uh, reapply integration by parts in these two terms. But now notice that the observable uh, as a gradient. So we can actually get a better estimate and it's crucial to get the better estimate. And we do it by applying lemma three, uh, which is uh, what I refer to as uh, uh, gradient integration by parts. So I will think of this thing uh, as, uh, I want to apply that uh, in the form uh, Somehow I split it like this, in which I want to think of this first term uh, as the term uh, uh, nabla i0 x0 phi, and the other terms are the uh, phi to the p and gradient phi to the q. Similarly here, I want to apply the, the gradient uh, integration by parts with this first factor equal to the first factor uh, up there. Okay, and I want to apply the, the integration by part uh, formula of lemma three at uh, precision zero. Okay. 
Okay. So let me do that for uh, 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 whatever. I don't know the the the, the a term. So the a term is uh, um, uh, the, the 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 a term using the uh, lemma three is uh, one sixth. Um, um, gradient uh, i x uh, of g comma y sum over y and then i have uh, uh, i have what i have uh, um uh, gradient phi uh, y of phi 0 squared and then there is a remainder that is uh, uh, t to the whatever power you like uh, plus uh, order t to the one minus epsilon um, uh, support of p support of uh, uh, q so for us uh, uh, support of p is zero support of q uh, union x zero is x so this is just one over one plus x okay so the the advantage uh, of lemma two is that you have a first term that has no decay but has the power alpha that is as large as we like and the second term that is order uh, t to the one minus epsilon, but with a decay term and this decay is fundamental for 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 being able to perform the summations over x and y if you didn't, if we didn't have this, uh, we wouldn't have some ability over x and y. And this is somehow the technical point uh, where we need to go beyond uh, what Brickmon and company uh, did. Okay, here you see, see here you have uh, additional two terms. So you, you you have the case in which the derivative acts on phi zero, and the derivative the, the case in which the derivative uh, acts here. Uh, whatever <laughs> I mean. So we get here a delta uh, y zero plus uh, uh, whatever delta y x minus delta y x plus e i um, uh, twice uh, y zero nabla i x phi. And again, we can uh, uh, now apply uh, lemma two to the computation of this and this. So I, 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 I think I don't want to, uh, to, to really go through all the computations. I, I, I think that uh, the ideas are, are clear. Lemma three, sorry. So again, here, lemma three. Again, here, lemma three. So the point is that we can iterate the applications of lemma one and lemma three a finite number of times up to the point in which we, we obtained um, uh, explicit terms plus remainders. The remainders are either uh, of uh, sufficient high power in T or have decay factors. The decay factors are fundamental to be able to sum over X and Y. I mean, you, you can check that uh, um, if you didn't have this decay, the uh, the bounds will be uh, of uh, uh, lower order than than what you desire and 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 so th this was actually an obstacle for us at the beginning to uh, understand how things uh, work uh, i believe that it's uh, it's fine like this i, I mean it, it took much more than uh, 15 minutes uh, i if you have additional questions just uh, ask me otherwise i think uh, the idea should be sufficiently clear that you can uh, reconstruct what I didn't uh, do, given for granted lemma one and lemma three at least. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, if you have any additional questions, uh, I'm happy to answer. Otherwise, maybe we can stop here. Serena, what do you say up, up, up there? Yeah, yeah. I think I don't see any, uh, any other question on, online. So I think, yes, we... We can thank Alessandro once more and yeah, we can stop here. Yeah. Thanks.
اتصالات 